Hello everyone, my name is Carolina and I'm here representing ArcBound Foundation, a charity working to widen the access to literature and improve diversity within publishing. And today here with us, we have Dr. Morgan Phillips, uh, who is the co-director of the Glacier Trust, uh, an, an NGO that is enabling climate change adaptation in Nepal. He also has a PhD in environmental education which is part of his work as well. And actually before joining the Glacier Trust, he also ran an intercultural understanding charity named Global Footsteps and was a lecturer on po the politics of climate change at Grinnell University. So Dr. Morgan's book will be coming out this uh, uh, September with Arcbound Foundation and it's called Great Adaptations. So welcome uh, Dr. Morgan, thank you for being here with us. Um, Hi there, thank you, Carolina. Lovely to, lovely to meet you and to, and to be part of this conversation. Thank you. So I'm going to sort of want to kickstart the conversation by asking you, so what was your personal journey that actually led to your current work with the Glacier Trust and to eventually writing this book as part of your work? Great, thanks. Um, well, I guess, you know, I've been incredibly lucky, really. I mean, it's just a total privilege to do the work that I do both with Glacier Trust and with Global Action Plan. Um, and I'm sort of very kind of aware of, you know, this this obviously isn't about isn't about me. And that, you know, I'm always been um conscious of of how fortunate I am to have grown up in the part of the world which I grew up in and in, in the time that I grew up. So I went to um a really brilliant comprehensive school in, in West Wales, on the west coast of Wales. Um, and I was there sort of surrounded by nature and near the coast, and that really connected me to lots of environmental issues from a really early age. And I'd, I guess to sow the seed of, of kind of working in the sector um, and and also I think um, Ceredigion which is my home county um, is it's one of the poorest parts of the UK and I think especially as I've got older it's really tuned me into social justice issues as well and how you know how much inequality there is in, in the UK and so I think that's kind of the origins of how I started to get into this work and then um, again I was really lucky to be you know I was in university for nearly a decade um, through most of my 20s um, it was a time when, you know, fees weren't as high as they are now. Um, I was able to do a PhD and, have, you know, have some funding to do a PhD, which, you know, is very fortunate. And, you know, I'm by no means a sort of high-flying Oxbridge graduate who gets to do a PhD. It was at a time when it was possible for, for people from my background and you know, my level of education to be able to do. It. And it was had a really transformative effect on me and how I sort of saw the world and understood what's truly important and that that kind of um, shaped then from quite early age in my sort of young adulthoods to to you know have very little desire to chase money and status and all those things I really always wanted to kind of work um, you know in kind of in service of others I suppose and and to work in the charity sector and that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years and um, after working kind of I kind of zigzag between working international development and environmental sector so just before I joined the Glacier Trust which was in 2016, so five years ago now, um, I'd been at Keep Britain Tidy, which is an environmental charity. I was head of eco schools um, for England for, for three years there. And yeah, I really, I guess I was looking for a fresh challenge and really wanting to get closer to where climate change is really having an impact and actually to work directly with people and not sort of behind a desk and, and to actually really do something which I could see the real time change. And, you know, we talk a lot about um stopping climate change preventing it but it was kind of i was having that awakening of more and more people were being affected by climate change it's like what are we doing with that you know how, how are we um sort of dealing with it with the fallout of, of climate change that's happening right now and so um that's that's what led me into working on on adaptation and it was um then sort of over the last five years of of kind of working with with Glacier Trust and learning more and more about adaptation, um, it started to dawn on me sort of a how little I really knew about it before I started that job, um, and sort of had a fast learning curve around it. But also how little it's talked about within the environmental sector specifically. A lot of my colleagues in the environmental sector still don't talk about it very often. It's not it's not really a topic which comes across our radar very often, and and that you know has really started to worry me sort of two or three years ago when I was really getting an understanding how big a challenge adaptation is going to be over the next few decades. I mean, people are already adapting now, but 
it's going to be it's just going to scale up and up and up the more as, as more and more change happens as the temperatures keep rising and all of the chaos that climate change is going to create is going to create so much more demand for adaptation and an adaptation can happen in good ways great ways as in great adaptations but it can happen in really not so great ways as well and there can be huge maladaptations which have really bad knock-on effects so um and a lot of it's happening in the shadows and so it's kind of you've got you know climate changes to an extent in the shadow of everything else which is going on in the world but it obviously it's becoming more in the foreground but when we do talk about climate change in that little bubble we really mostly talk about the mitigation side of climate change which is obviously massively important and kind of the other side of the coin but it's really overshadowed efforts in adaptation so adaptation has been somewhat left behind and i think that's that has really um it could have really negative effects on on especially on issues like inequality and justice so it's 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 key that we talk about it and so you know written great adaptations and kind of it's part of a broader project where we want to talk about get people talking about adaptation so it's deliberately provocative it has some quite controversial statements in it um it's it's got lots of examples of different types of adaptation from sort of micro ones which people do in their daily lives to like big institutional ones um some of them are good some of them are bad some of them are just you know a bit, a bit weird and a bit funny um so, and so it's kind of it's kind of i'm hoping that there's going to be examples that people say oh i read about this in this book like i read about the camels in australia and how they're invading into people's towns to, their, to take their water and and how the australian government has decided to shoot them as a consequence of the kind of weird sort of adaptation story and so there's all this stuff going on um there's plenty to talk about but um it's not being talked about and so really it was as a charity you know we you know, we work at the Glacier Trust, you know, we work on on adaptation in Nepal specifically, but we know that we need to get adaptation up the up the agenda. So there's more support for it. So there's more funding for it. And so more more and more people can be enabled to do it. So this is kind of our kind of part of our mission is to advocate for adaptation to be on the agenda at places like COP26 and to be prominent, not just on the agenda of the politicians, but to be prominent on, in the media agenda as well because we know how important that is to to actually things changing so that's kind of the origins of it and um of in some ways the lockdown was helpful because it gave me a bit more time in the evenings to write it but um it was also you know threw a massive curve for into like what the future looks like and so it's it's um it's taken about a year and a half to to pull together and i'm really fortunate to work with one of my friends is a brilliant designer and um one of her friends who's who's an artist who've we've um pulled it together so it's not just text on a page it has lots of imagery and artwork in it and quite colorful so hopefully it's quite a nice shareable object as well yeah well so as you as you mentioned this uh concept of climate adaptation is something that you are not normally exposed to um and it's just stated in the title of the book which is great adaptations so i was wondering if you can at least for those that are already watching this video maybe if you could explain a little bit more about the concept of climate adaptation what it is why it is important yeah um so yeah, that's a good question how to define it exactly i think it is i mean humans are obviously you know we adapt all the time we have we have a kind of a long, long, long history of adapting to change and adapting to our external environments and changes in our external environments. And so um, climate change adaptation specifically is, is making adaptations to the changes which climate is bringing into our lives, either um, that we notice or that we don't notice. So there can be adaptations which kind of creep up on us and we kind of don't realize that we're doing them. So things like, um, we might adapt our kind of leisure habits. So it might be that for many summers, we've spent time um, just thinking back to my time in West Wales and my dad um, has been sailing since he was a kid. So he's to sail all the time. And gradually over the last few years, because the harbour where he keeps his boat is getting more and more often, it gets affected by flooding upstream. So the river fills up comes down brings all these massive logs down into the harbour and it's sunk quite a few of the boats and you've also got the rising sea level so the water can't escape and so it's kind of makes the harbour really dangerous and so it means that people there now and this has been happening whereas it used to happen sort of once every 50 years or something it's happening kind of every other year at the moment now and so so it, it's 
so my dad has he's decided to give up his boat and to you know do his leisure in other ways so cycling and bowling and stuff that he's into now and he's that is a kind of an adaptation to climate change because the the risk of keeping the boat in the harbour um has kind of crept up and crept up to the point where it's like it's not worth taking the risk anymore and so he's adapted his behavior as a result of it but there's other obviously bigger adaptations which are things like how do we cope with um um sea level rise um do we build um huge sea walls out of concrete to to kind of hold back the waves or do we um invest in more nature-based solutions which are to grow sort of mangroves and to have more vegetation around around the seafront to try and absorb the water in that way so there's those kind of adaptations that are made at kind of government local government level to around infrastructure and so on um, and there's adaptations around keeping kind of you know how do we keep cool so people are starting to sort of write how do we how do we air condition our homes Can we, you know do we just buy loads of air conditioning or do we you know, air conditioning units or do we do things like um have more plants in the home which can help to filter the air and keep it cool so this these are all sort of there can be planned adaptations there can be kind of instinctive adaptations that are happening um but we're all kind of adapting in different ways to to the changes that are in front of us and not always in not always in conscious ways and not always in good ways but i think the more mindful and careful we are about adaptation we can do it in really positive ways so um yeah it's a big field but um, we'll probably discuss it a bit more as we go through the chat Yes, so you have already mentioned some examples. So apparently climate adaptation can take a lot of different forms. And you even already mentioned the, that they can have really strange and even maladaptation, as you called it. Mm -hmm. um, so during our whole journey to write this book, uh, could you maybe let us know what was one of the worst examples uh, and also one of the most inspiring ones of climate adaptation that you have cr come across? Yeah. Um... Yeah, there's kind of there's kind of quirky ones as well, which are really interesting. So the so the one which which really struck me was in um in the Alps in in France. Um all the ski resorts which are in the Alps, like hundreds of them have closed down, which I didn't realise. I mean I didn't realise how many there they used to be, but lots and lots of ski resorts have had to close because because they don't get enough snow in the winter anymore. And there's other ones which are kind of clinging on for dear life and trying to trying to keep going um despite the lack of snow. And in, I'll probably get the pronunciation wrong, but it's in Luchon Super Wagner's, um, which is in the Alps. It's probably a completely terrible pronouncement, so apologies to any French speakers. Um, they, it's the, the ski resort there is on the kind of lower slopes of the mountain, and it wasn't getting enough snow. And so the town's mayor decided to commission helicopters to fly up the mountain, scoop up snow into massive bags, and then bring that snow down to the lower slopes and dump it on the slopes so that so the skiing could continue and so that and he sort of said well this is a one-off because this is extremely honest like well it's not going to be a one-off because this isn't going to change and so that that was one which shocked me and then you know that's part of the wider story of around ski resorts of of you know creating fake snow so they have these snow making machines which use huge amounts of fossil fuels to actually be powered you know they've kind of diesel generated things and they they could basically take take in water, freeze it, and then spray it onto the slopes. And that, that sort of started in New York, I think, in the 1960s. But now, like, ski resorts all over the world have have these snow machines, which are kind of spraying all the snow. And what it does, um, which is interesting side of the adaptation story, is that it kind of creates a bit of a fake reality. <laughs> it's kind of for the people who go and visit those ski resorts. If they don't get up early enough in the morning to see these sprayers going off, or don't really take notice of them it's kind of like oh well the climate hasn't changed because the snow's still here it's kind of like it's kind of a, a form of denial in that sense it's like well we'll adapt by spraying snow and kind of keeping keeping the ski resort alive and it can kind of delay the need for climate action because people don't it doesn't seem extreme as extreme to people if, if the snow is still there or if or if there is a way of kind of working around the problem of there being no snow by spraying snow so it kind of can have that kind of delaying denialist kind of effect as well with adaptation i even saw that um in moscow in red square at christmas time they're now putting fake snow and it to you know to make it look like a winter wonderland and that's kind of happening as well which is which is crazy um and then in terms of like the better more positive examples so it's 
it's kind of looking for ways in which for me it's ways in which adaptation is part of a broader um strategy of kind of transforming the the kind of the social and economic conditions which are creating climate change in the first place so we obviously we live in a certain economic system and a certain social system and political system which is continues to generate um environmental problems and you know climate change being the, the, the kind of one of the key ones um and so you know if, if you have adaptation which is kind of trying to protect that existing structure then it is that sort of denialist thing that's so the kind of spraying of the snow but if you have adaptation which is part of a broader transformative agenda which is trying to address issues of economic inequality gender equality uh, racial inequality and so on then those are the really inspiring ones that, that are happening because they're actually trying to the adaptation is just a part of a broader transformative process so i think probably um the most exciting thing that's i think is happening in at the moment is what's happening in rahava in in northern northern syria in the kurdish part of northern syria or the syrian part of kurdistan depending on your perspective um so in in rahava um in the fallout from these obviously the horrendous civil war that's happening there and the kind of vacuum of political vacuum which which it created um the people of of rahava kind of went on a guess kind of rebuilding mission and a transformative mission around right we want to run this society differently when we want to run it along with with feminist principles and with ecological principles with equality we want to decentralize decision making we want to have more citizen assemblies so on we want to live in harmony with with the environment as much as we can i mean and it's as much as they can while also fighting a war so there is obviously they have like that going on but they're also in spite of that they're also still able to have this incredible kind of movement towards a more socially just and 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 ecologically uh, mindful and sustainable society and within that they'll you know there'll be adap adaptations to check to to climate change going on within all that in terms of how they're how they're kind of keeping their homes cool and what crops they're growing and how they're kind of creating more um diverse range of crops and not not having monocultures which is what was kind of enforcing them before so having you know it's a way of being more resilient to climate changes to have a bigger variety of crops that can cope with the different weathers and so on so i think the make rahava green movement i think is one of the most inspiring things which i've come across in recent years and really kind of and actually inspired me a little bit to write this book so it's with the book that they created is um, printed by the same printers we're going to use for, for great adaptation of them which have a great workers cooperative here in london so um so that one but i think and then you know i've been inspired massively by what i have encountered firsthand in in nepal as well which is a real agroforestry based approach which is again has has that really systems thinking element to it it's about health it's about gender it's about um how can we improve um how can we adapt to climate change in ways which also enable us to to develop as a society and so that's been really inspiring seeing how they're growing um testing out because it's in obviously a mountainous area so the kind of basically what's happening is that crops can grow further and further up the mountains but also insects can get further and further up the mountains and so it's it's seeing how they're experimenting with different crops that can grow in at different altitudes and in creating these um wonderful kind of intercropping systems and layer farming systems where you can grow coffee and bananas and root crops all in the same plot of land and and they all kind of um work with each other in a really symbiotic way to to kind of benefit and so those are the adaptations which are really kind of exciting me and and i think are, are really great and then there's you know there's there's loads of, there's loads of examples I, I can't think of them all at the top of my head but um the the ones for me though that really are great are the ones which are kind of working with nature and not trying to deny nature and not trying to kind of use adaptation as a way to mask there being a problem and i think that's where people get really frustrated with, with adaptation as a gender they think it's just something which rich people do to kind of pretend that nothing's wrong or that rich people do to protect themselves from the damage that they've caused to the world while not really caring about anybody else and the kind of hunkering down and adapting i think that's where people get frustrated but where, where people are doing it in a in a transformative way it's really exciting 
So uh, despite there being a lot of positive examples in this book, some of which you've just mentioned in this uh, previous response, the third part of the book goes into exploring this more uh, the predicting doom perspectives that civilization has failed, a bit more negative uh, about climate change. So I would like to ask, why did you feel the need to address them? And given that people um, tend to feel a little bit desperate when faced with these uh, perspectives, what would you say to help them feel a little bit less powerless? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think, um, you know, the idea of the book is to, is to talk about adaptation in all its different forms and its good and bad forms um and the kind of discourse around adaptation has has kind of developed over the last few years as people have become more i guess aware of the need to adapt and also become kind of yeah like you say a bit more desperate about the situation that we're moving into of you know potentially going past 1.5 degrees past two degrees possibly past three degrees of warming and all of the horrific impacts that's going to have. I mean, we have to remember that we're at 1.2 degrees of warming now, and there's already in parts of the world absolute, you know, bedlam being caused by it in terms of you think of the, the hurricanes and the storms and the floodings and the heat waves and there's so much damage being done already at just 1.2 degrees. And so the the adaptation forms that are going to be necessary in the coming decades, even if we manage to get to two degrees and stabilize and sort of come back down again, you know, in my lifetime temperatures are going to continue to rise as you know we're going to be living in a in a hotter and hotter world for most of the people who are adults now it's not going to get back below sort of temp average temperatures of now it's very unlikely that will happen um unless there's some sort of crazy you know intergalactic cosmic thing which goes on which we don't know about if the earth's orbit or something changes but um it's not likely that things are going to change and so i think i didn't want to leave the kind of deep adaptation thing as a as an elephant in the room because it's out there, it's something that people talk about, so I wanted to address it. There's really interesting bits within deep adaptation which people, insights which, which are helpful to people because they kind of force us to ask deeper questions about how we're living and the values we live by and so on and kind of globalised world or it's localised world and so on. So I think there's stuff in there which people are really interested by and are taking a lot from, but there's also the kind of other side of it where people get really quite passionately um, disagreements with with kind of deep adaptation advocates because they see it as as a as a kind of doomist perspective of of giving up that there's no point trying anymore and actually we just need to kind of hunker down and look after ourselves and i think there's big frustration in that um but it's been a really fascinating movement i mean hundreds of thousands of people have read you know what is quite a long academic paper um about about deep adaptation and it's spawned a lot of debate um but yeah i think um I found it really interesting when I first engaged with it, but did feel that kind of worry about where it's taking us in terms of are people going to give up and go quite insular about their responses, <coughs> which is why I was really quite excited now about something which has come out of that um, thinking and a kind of come out of the Extinction Rebellion type thinking is, the, is this idea of transformative adaptation, which, is, which I touched on a bit earlier, which is how we think about, okay, adaptation is a given, we're going to adapt. It's like we can't it's impossible not to be adapting um can we do that adaptation in a way which is also transformative and this is where we talk about the kind of civilization and the end of civilization so i think the deep adaptation people will talk about there's a collapse coming like near-term social collapse and it's going to fall apart and it's going to be very messy and it's going to be like a bomb site of collapsing you know collapse institutions and so on and like hunger and lack of food and all those things um there's talk about that but then there's also talk about civilization ending in a kind of more planned way as in like it's crumbling and it could and it's possible that it can be dismantled because when you think about what western civilization is actually about it's it's become almost hegemonic it's kind of covers the it's kind of spread out across the whole world and and is kind of overpowering all sorts of other types of civilization and kind of you know gobbling them up or kind of commodifying them and so on um and it's you know for the people who live kind of um within western civilization and feel the benefits of it it's a pretty comfortable existence and i you know i'm part of that and been fortunate of that but really we're in the minority you know there's not that many people who do actually live comfortably within western civilization the reality is that most people live uncomfortably with it 
it's kind of something which happens to them um it's kind of um it's it's the pushing out of a kind of model of how how to run economies and how to run countries which is spread out across the world but we know after kind of 30 years of this kind of neoliberal capitalist agenda um it's leading to all sorts of problems there's, there's all sorts of you know, climate change is just one symptom of of it there's all sorts of other problems which come out of um of the way the world is currently structured and so it may be that it's going to um start to dismantle and then the question is is what are the what's what's the successor to it is it going to be one successor we're going to have a completely different one other kind of global hegemonic system or are we going to have lots of lots of smaller successor civilizations so in a more kind of localized way and so it's really there's lots of interesting stuff and i talked about rahava earlier as a potential example of a successor civilization that might inspire other people in say the middle east to look at how they're doing in rahava that seems to be peaceful there's more equality those are the things we want you know why don't we copy some of those ideas and try and try them in our in our region or our country and, and work towards that so this the transformative adaptation stuff is is really interesting to look at it's early days in terms of what it is and what it does but yeah i wanted to put it out there because it's um it's yeah like i said at the beginning the book is deliberately trying to be provocative and get people talking about these things and and to ask those deeper questions about um you know what is causing you know what are the root causes of climate change that are forcing us to adapt and you know we can't just adapt and leave the root causes still still flowing on that would be ridiculous so we have to think about how can we address the root causes while we're also adapting to the impacts of climate change um so that's yeah that's why it's in there <laughs> And it'll be really interesting to hear um, thoughts on it and what people and um, how people respond to it. It's I, I, for me, it's it's not it's probably not a fully formed position. I'm still wrestling with these ideas, and because they are quite new, and I think um, we'll continue to in the future. But I, I see it gives me great hope because I think there's what we're starting to see, and I think it's a little bit happening in the poll as well, is that um, people are kind of wanting to change the structures. In which, within which they live for the better and to sort of have more power over their own lives and you know and there's kind of just kind of a triple win going on we can improve society we can improve our environmental footprint and lower it and we can also adapt to the changes that happen so i think yeah it's exciting okay it's yeah that's a little bit of those more inspiring examples that maybe can um, point us in another direction, even at a larger scale. Um, yeah. So, what can what do you think that the, that are some examples of simple things that anyone can do to contribute to this uh, kind of climate adaptation? Um, well, I think the key thing is, I mean, it's different wherever wherever people are in the world, the, their adaptation needs are going to be different, you know. So in terms of on a practical level, it's, you know, this is not the same sort of conversation as, um, you know, make sure you do your recycling or turn the taps off when you're cleaning your teeth. It's, you know, there's not the kind of five things you can do to save the planet sort of thing here. I think with, with adaptation, it's, it's first of all, sort of to be mindful of it, to, to be mindful that that's what you're maybe doing, you know, when you are changing your shopping list to have to include more sun cream because there's more heat there's, there's hotter days you know that's that's an adaptation and if i need to buy more sun cream what you know what packaging am i going to buy it in what's the, what's the what's the most um sort of ethical packaging or ethical company i can buy buy it from so there's so it's kind of be aware that you are adapting i think is the first thing to sort of reflect on what's happening in the world around you and what adaptations you're making your but maybe your employer is making, maybe your town is making, and kind of understand them. I think adaptation has quite a um, can be quite empowering as well because there's a lot of places around the world who have declared a climate emergency, which is great, off the back of kind of the pressure that Extinction Rebellion created. Um, but when they talk about their plans for it, it tends to be, what are we going to do to reduce our reduce our carbon emissions is mostly the conversation which obviously has to be central to the conversation but the interesting thing about that is that if a town or city reduces all of its carbon emissions and gets to kind of net zero 
it doesn't mean that every every other city is going to do the same thing and so they they are kind of um they're kind of at the mercy of greater forces but they do have control over the way that their town or city or village or street might adapt to climate change so they so they could be talking about say in copenhagen where they've experiencing um sort of more intense rainfall so they have more that instead of the rain being spread out over over a whole day or over a whole sort of month it kind of comes in one big deluge so you get these kind of deluges and droughts which is which means there's lots of water kind of flooding out onto the road and so they've seen that and they've adapted to that by by putting in a, a drainage system to be able to cope with the, with this extra water and so that is that is a way in which a country or a city can can sort of adapt and, and it's something that you can do and to create a positive impact so i think for politicians it's especially local politicians can say right we can see climate change coming here's our adaptation strategy come and come and join us and help create it so i think talk to politicians local politicians about what's happening in our town or city to adapt to the changes we're seeing because of climate change that's another thing that people can do um but then yeah more broadly i think it's you know the key thing i want i guess a third thing would be for Know, people to have conversations about adaptation really to just get it up the agenda get people talking about it because we know that there's the promises that have been made for funding from central governments and international bodies for how much funding there's going to be for adaptation those commitments aren't being um reached there's still there's still an adaptation gap there's not a, there's not as much finance available for adaptation as has been promised or as is more importantly as is needed and so we need to get it on the agenda so that people who are remember people who are most affected by climate change are the, normally the ones who have the least voice you know and they have and they they aren't able to lobby as easily for it and so there's there's a real need to to get out the agenda to make sure that people who are most impacted by climate change are, are unable to adapt to it while they're also trying to mitigate it so that would be the kind of third one um i can't think of any more really sort of tangible ones at this at this point but um I really, yeah, I think it's just just to be aware that just to kind of have a bit of reflection on the adaptations that are happening is is the, really the key thing to think about. Yeah, those are already some things to to leave us thinking about what we can do. Uh, so my final question would be: it's a little bit of a question with two questions in it, but it's about your hopes. So, what are your hopes for the COP conference happening this November? And also your hopes for what the book can achieve. Um, well, the book, I think I'll start with that because that's a much smaller, <laughs> much smaller thing. Um, yeah, I think I hope it achieves some. I hope it's of interest to, to people who haven't really engaged with adaptation before. So I'm hoping that it's it's going to be a way into the topic, and I'm kind of hopefully thick-skinned enough to you know to accept that some people there'll be bits in it which they don't like but there'll be bits in it which will be interested and i'm quite happy for people to kind of um to have the conversations around yeah like the conversation we had around deep adaptation just before i think um you know we, i think it's important to have those conversations so really my hope for it is that people pick it up and read it and and it's a way into adaptation for them and that, and that they go on to read more about adaptation and engage with it and start to sort of talk to colleagues about it and um and that environmental organizations i mean we did some research um a few years ago we did two rounds of it where we looked at how many adaptation stories greenpeace friendly earth wwf and um, the green party and rspb who were kind of the biggest environmental organizations in the uk we looked at how many adaptation stories they write on their blogs and their news articles and it was tiny it was kind of less than one percent of the articles that they write are about adaptation and i think adaptation is something that people are doing and you can do it in green ways and you can do it in non-green ways and you can do it in socially just ways and you can do it in non-just ways and so just like traveling around is something that people do and we try and find greener ways for them to do it adaptation is something that people do and we need to try and find greener ways for them to do it so they know so they don't just crank up the air conditioning, burn a hollow to fossil fuels to stay cool and then create more climate change in the process. So we need we kind of need environmental charities to to get alongside people and to support them in in thinking about their adaptation decisions, thinking about how they can 
adapt in mindful ways and we need kind of just adaptation in the same that we need way that we need to just transition and so that's my hope for it is that it people start to recognize that it is something which is increasingly happening in the world more and more of it is only going to there's only going to be more of it happening in the coming years and how can we how can our towns and cities in the western world especially adapt in ways which aren't just going to exacerbate the climate change problem so how can we there's an example in the book about in paris there's a part of their strategy is to have um cool rooms where people on a really really hot day um if they don't have air conditioning in their homes um they can go to a municipal building and there's a room set up which has one air conditioning unit and then it has kind of magazines and water and people can chat and it's quite community orientated so it's a bit like going to the pub like in the in the old days people used to go to the pub because it was a source of communal heat so there's one fire which you know 20 people could share to stay warm so it really reduces the impact of it rather than having 20 fires and so cool rooms are kind of the equivalent of that where there's an air conditioner just one of them which can keep loads of people cool rather than everybody having an air conditioner and it kind of expands our notion of what home is and so there's things like that which which are the things which need to be put in place and you know and environmental organizations could be at the forefront of making that happen um which i guess links into cop 26 and what we what we want to see there is to think about yeah how is you know adaptation and mitigation the, the two sides of the same coin they both need to happen they both need to complement each other and, and we need to think of them as kind of comrades rather than kind of you know right we'll stop mitigation and we'll just start adapting and like that's not that's not the reality it's not an either or it's they're very much overlapping with each other and you can do both at the same time and so it's really i'd love to see that come together more and this is really a question of the global north being willing to work with global south more closely and listen to what to, to the needs and to and to address some of those in those injustices which are really central to climate change and you know we didn't get a chance to talk about it but you know climate change really is a justice issue it's like it's such a perfect lens to see it through and um there's so much injustice built up in it and so, and there's a real need at the cop 26 to get adaptation further up the agenda so that countries are really being held to account on the on the adaptation plans they're making so that businesses are really being held to held to account on the adaptation choices they're making and so that there is more scrutiny around adaptation so that people can't get away with adapting in really self-interested ways and are really in, incentivize and push to adapt in socially just ways and, and sort of ecologically mindful ways so it's nature-based solutions rather than kind of concrete dams and i think unless we're having the conversation people are going to be able to continue to do adaptation in the shadows in kind of self-interested ways and cause more climate change um, but if it's on the agenda and if we're talking about it then then adaptation will have to be um something that people are when they're doing it they're kind of being held to account by by the media by opposition mps by constituents to really sort of ensure that the adaptation choices are the right ones because there's a big danger that um if it's if it remains in the shadows that people will just be able to sort of just get on and do it without sort of any sort of pushback or or anything like that and they'll kind of abuse their power and to, to keep power through doing it so yeah i guess that's that's the main point get it get it on the agenda and get it talked about more and um and to see yeah more in investment in in adaptation which has a kind of um transformative agenda behind it to help to help transform society and make make um you know, help with other agendas around equality and so on thank you so much uh dr morgan it has been a real pleasure talking to you and thank you for sharing all of these examples you've sure given us a lot of food for thought about this topic um and for anyone that is interested in finding out more uh you please check out uh the book great adaptations you can also uh, pre-order it even if you like uh, you can find the link in the description uh, if you're also interested in finding out more about the work of the glacier trust you can also find links there um, to their website and to their social media uh, so uh, hoping to see you all again soon and uh, thank you again for joining us dr morgan and thank you for all the amazing work that you are doing thanks caroline it was lovely to, to meet you and to have this conversation thanks for yeah the work that you're doing too um, 
to get adaptation discussed. It's really great that this conversation is even happening. So thank you. Thank you.